a pasados estos breves minutos de, de cortesía. Good morning. After we've given a few minutes for people to arrive, we're going to start to our presentation on this publication. But first of all, we'd like to thank all of you for being here. As you know, today we will be presenting monograph number eight, City Care and Education, which is part of a collection of monographs. We've already published seven before that, um, sorry about the, uh, Organism, sport, youth, uh, social inclusion, environment, and culture, amongst others. And with all of these monographs, what we want to work on is on the link between education and a city, and also looking at other aspects of our charter. Today's event is going to last about an hour and a half. And we will be working in the following way. We will have with us Yayo Herrero. Welcome. She's the coordinator of this publication. And we also have different authors of the monograph with us. And they will be taking the floor and answering different questions. And then afterwards, if we manage to keep to time, we will open up this dialogue with other the cities that are with us today. So for me, it's a pleasure to introduce Eva Kale. She's an urban planner and gender planning expert from the uh, town hall of Vienna. It's also a pleasure to introduce Ye Won Nam, one of you who were at the Congress in Andong may already know her. She is on the city hall team of Andong, and she will be talking about the Happy Learning Centers. And then we also have with us Enrique Gramadas Pastor, who's the coordinator of European projects and also on the neighborhood policy of the City Hall of Barcelona. And he's going to talk about climate shelters in schools. And this was one of the experiences that won the last uh, edition of Educating Cities Award. This afternoon, we also have another presentation of this publication, which will have different authors with us because this is a collaborative uh, work. There have been 12 different contributions and uh, Yayo Herrero, who has that uh, interaction part. As you know, she's an anthropologist, a social educator, a teacher, and an eco-feminist activist. And she's also uh, working on the uh, modification, the update of the charter on 2020. So go ahead, yeah, you have the floor. Good morning to all of you. So the first thing I want to do with this uh, presentation of a monograph is to be able to show what we've been doing. It's been a pleasure to be able to work with the International Association of Educating Cities and uh, once again on working on this monograph has been a big pleasure. The coordination of the monograph, although Marina very generously said that I was in charge of that, it's been a collective task. She's participated in it, also Maria Angeles Cabeza, and all the secretariat in general of uh, the International Association of Educating Cities. And I think that when you read this document, you'll see that, uh, hopefully agree with me, that I think it's been a very interesting uh, task in the end. So. I'll just briefly like to talk a bit about it. The monograph, when we initially thought about it and when we invited the various people to uh, participate, we started on the basis of the knowledge of a complex situation that humanity is going through, uh, the humanities on our planet Earth, which uh, as everyone knows, uh, now we're going through a profound crisis, an ecological one, the climate change, and also the degradation of basic assets, basic goods that are the pillars of our global economy as we know it today. And there's also a very large loss of biodiversity. And all of this connects with strong tensions and fractures that affect human beings and communities such as poverty, inequality, expansion or an increase of authoritarianism, uh, also um, misogynistic processes in some places, and also an exclusion of many people from their territories. So there's a migratory dynamics that have to be 
approach not just from the security perspective, but also from the ethical and the political uh, approach. So they take care of the lives of the people in this world in crisis. And we also acknowledge that human life is a vulnerable one. We are vulnerable as individuals. And when we say that, we, what we mean is that we are all people that have needs. We need shelter, we need food, uh, housing, water, to participation, recognition, and also we need care. Care is an essential element, especially at some points of our life cycle, so that people can have dignified lives and lives that are worth living. The cities are at the heart of all these conflicts and also at the heart of the possible solutions. In the first place, because cities are the large drains of energy, of materials, they are the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases, and also the scenarios where many of these contradictions and tensions that I mentioned before were played out. There are also places in which there is an enormous capacity, enormous creativity and possibilities of imagining, of uh, dreaming and of playing out different ways of organizing our common lives in order to solve that ecological crisis that I was talking about. It's both an ecological and a social crisis. So, uh, monograph started with the idea that human life cannot sustain by it can be sustained by itself you need to intentionally sustain it and in order to do that we need politics economy and culture and uh, everything that organizes our shared lives has a priority of sustaining that so it may sound quite trivial but it isn't because if our priority were only the profitability and a return on investment and economic growth, then the priority is not to sustain those lives. It's our priority to sustain life in a dignified manner. That means that policy, uh, economy and cultures have to be uh, subjected to this sustainability of a life. So throughout history, those of who mostly have taken care of looking after vulnerable and finite bodies have usually been women in their majority and not women because we consider that women are better prepared from a genetic perspective to take care of others, but because we live in societies in which the sexual division of the work has usually uh, been um, separate in such a way and women have had to take the task. So in order to of co assuming co-responsibility of working together, it means that all people have to take care. We have to defeminize it, not because women have to stop caring, but because everybody has to be responsible for caring. And we also have make public ins and private institutions responsible for taking care of other lives. And that is key. That's why we thought it would be very interesting to have a monograph on city care and education. So let's very briefly talk about the structure of our monograph. There are three main parts to it. In the first part, we have three interviews which have allowed us to look closer at these aspects which we were concerned about. And so we have carried out three different interviews. One of these was to my Amaya Perez Orozco. She's a feminist and economist. She has a long-standing uh, history in working with care. And we've tried to take a closer look at what we're actually talking about when we talk about care. And we don't want to make it too simplistic in our approach. We want to show all the tensions that revolve around the world of care and also trying to avoid an excessively voluntaristic aspect, uh, which sometimes leads to the deepening of the, this divide and the oppression of women. Then in second place, we interviewed Eva Kao. You have the pleasure of from her later because she's here with all of us. And then we've tried to take a closer look at what the urban 
planning and design of a city it would look like from the feminist perspective. She also uh, offers interesting experiences that we'll hear more about later. And the third interview was to Francisco Obando. And this interview focuses mainly on the issue of health. So a comprehensive viewpoint of health. And we've looked at the key aspects and the inevitable necessary connection between health and care. In the second block of our monograph, we have four interviews, four interviews to four women that from different perspectives offer a lot. And I think they show a very complementary and polyadric uh, perspective of to the care approach. First of all, Veronica Gago, she's an activist and as an lecturer, she comes from the New Menos Collective in Argentina. The second one, Lucy Nicolini, she worked at the City Hall. And she's had a lot of experience with everything on that has to do with all the people expelled from their territories that unfortunately not find their welcome nor the necessary policies in able to take the reins of their lives and in order to make sure that they are taken care of. And then there's another interview to Gaël Rouget. She's the uh, Councillor for Education and from the Rennes metropolitan area. And we've talked a lot about education. And the final one to other Carlao, the mayor of Barcelona. And then we focus mainly on everything that has to do with food which is key from the perspective of care, looking at justice, at sustainability and care. And finally, we have five experiences that we think are very significant. These are experiences that we have picked amongst many, many others that we could have chosen. There are so many interesting and relevant initiatives out there. So around revolving around educating cities and associations that's a huge amount of work being carried out but we tried to pick a selection that covered different spheres that we consider to be in, of interest to our monograph later on we will hear from the experience in andong and Nang will be telling us more about that about the Happy Learning Centers. There's also another experience from Portugal, from Villanova Filamisao. It's an experience that's called Envolvarte, which is focused on a social circus. Then another experience from Barcelona. It has to do with climate shelters. Enrique Cremades will be talking more about that. And there's a fourth one, which is from Horizonte Brazil. And this is an initiative of Afro-Brazilian women that have developed an uh, emancipating project on the basis of embroidery. And then finally, an, another experience from Lourdes City Council in Portugal, where they have worked in a co-responsible and participatory method on the issue of water, which is key right now, and especially in the area in which this, ex this was carried out. So these last three were the ones that won the Educating Cities Award in the last edition, which was an edition which was full of fantastic and brilliant initiatives. And these three are a, a sample of this very high value that all these experiences have. And well, I hope you find it interesting we have really, really put a lot of enthusiasm and care into the drafting of this monograph. Obviously, we can't include everything in here. That would have been impossible. But, but we do want to include some of the key debates to look at this. So important issues, which are uh, health, care and uh, education in the field of cities. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Yayo, for this overview of our publication. As you can see, this is not just a theoretical um, exercise, but we have good practices here of different members of our association and also the authors. As the pandemic has really shown how important care is to life and also 
co-responsibility between genders, not just between men and women, but also between uh, members, between states at different levels, also uh, from the company perspective and between different organizations. So without further ado, we're now going to move on to our uh, speakers. Our moderator is going to ask questions to our various authors. So I don't have anything more to add on my part. Very good. So let's start our roundtable. Marina already introduced the people who are going to take the floor. So let's just move on to the questions. The first of these was for Eva Kais, who is an urban planner and a gender expert from the City Council of Vienna in Austria. So Eva, most of us live in cities in which the car is uh, very much present. There are uh, huge pollution issues, but there's also um, urban planning issue when it comes to organizing our lives. Now you're an expert, what is feminist uh, urban planning and what fields are you working? So hola and good morning from my side. Um, um, I think that uh, the situation in our cities is that it is really um, to, to connect the, the, the planning issue with care work, it's really a bit that care work, and this was the feminist analysis uh, starting, that it's a bit the invisible work, and it's the same in planning topics. Um, and it, this is very interesting because I think there is a professional understanding in the planning field. Planners know uh, what is good for everybody. And this is that they always decide conflicting targets about space and time and structures. And this is a bit what I always say is the daily bread to decide this conflict of targets. But it was really very for a very long time and specifically after the Second World War that it was really uh, the, may, the planning profession was dominated by the male middle class white men uh, commuting to the city center and with a everyday life where there were no care possibilities at all. Of course, this is a bit very... Um, stereotype but nevertheless uh, it, it's also I think it was the statistical reality and I think your everyday life experience unconsciously influences also your uh, how you decide these conflicting targets I know there are more structural reasons also but I think this very uh, biased everyday focus really dominated the structures of our cities. And you see this influence on very different levels and it has a very direct impact, for example, for uh, how we organize our mobility. And so this car domination, it really makes the strict chains you need for going to shopping, doing the shopping, bringing the children to the kindergarten, to primary school, um, sport trainings, events, uh, etc. So all caretakers know how tiring this can be. And so this really depends on how the mobility system is organized. Uh, how safe it is, and it's not only this, this so, so this is mobility issues and how we organize public space, but also green spaces and the parks and how far away it is. When you have a small child or you are a vulnerable elderly person, so it's really, um, it, it's really an obstacle sometimes, and it's really it makes a difference if you how far away the next park is and how how the amenity is or how many obstacles are. And for example, benches for sometimes there are amenity for people, but for some people they, it's a necessity to organize their 
mobility and they are really have to plan their ways about their possibilities to sit down and we will hear later on about climate issue now it's not only the bench and the sitting facility it's also that you need shadow and a, a microclimate but because it does not help you a bench in a urban heat island in open sun so you really find it on very different layers and feminism, and this is what I find so convincing, it's not only formulating the functional needs, it's also discussed the question about who makes the decision, who is involved, what kind of perspective is uh, taken into account. Um, and... Uh, uh, we always are so and so the institutionalized so the feminist approach it's also a political approach uh, and the pro more professional expression is gender planning and so this means to take into account the need of the different target groups so as we call it in Vienna it's the gender plus concept because it's about social roles and very important is this care perspective, but also age or social and economic and cultural backgrounds. So the different groups have different needs. And um, in the planning lyrics, very often these common interests are involved, but on the in the when it's about really conflicting targets and taking decisions and in more planning streets, it's really, if you give more space to cars, you have less space for pedestrians or bikers. So then it's really what kind of perspective uh, you take into account. And so we always say it really uh, leads to a better quality if you take on these gender lenses, as we call it, and to make this holistic view. And we have branded this in Vienna about fair shared cities and fair cities, fair share. So here I want to stop. Uh, yes. Muchas gracias, Eva. Luego retomamos algunas de estas cuestiones contigo. Thank you very much, Eva. We'll touch upon all of this a little bit later on so that we can broaden your views and our next question is for Sofia Yewonnam Andong. She's uh, one of the people responsible for the happy learning centers in her country and my question for you firstly is what is the primary goal? What do you intend to achieve with happy learning centers in terms of benefits to the public? Hello, good morning. It's a pleasure to speak to you about the happy learning centers the primary goal with our happy learning centers is to provide greater educational opportunities to all the citizens so that they can enjoy the pleasures of learning. Now, in order to make this happen, we have focused on two main features. One is proximity and also demand of participants. When we began to uh, do physical exercise in the gym, a lot of people would say, well, we need this to be close to home. Uh, we can't go to the gym if the gym is too far from home. And the same applies to learning. The desire to learn something new is the most important aspect, but good accessibility to learning helps to maintain that desire alive. Our happy learning centers provide a space where people can carry out ongoing training throughout their lives close to their homes and their communities. The city of Andong is operating the happy learning centers in each district so that citizens can access permanent ongoing education in a very easy manner. You can see it on the map. Here you see our various centers. They're located in different areas of the city so that all our citizens, all the communities can access these centers close to home. Another important feature, our program has been designed, bearing in mind the characteristics of demand 
that is participants who wish to access these centers and also location of these happy centers. The one in Yonsang Du is located, for example, in an area with a lot of elderly population. Given that most of the users here are elderly in age, we carry out different programs targeting them, especially, for example, well-being, health, in order to try to meet the needs of our elderly population. The center in Oktong, here we have another happy learning center. Here we see that there are massive apartment buildings and a lot of younger residents and also migrant population. So in this case, we've implemented programs that center on family issues and also cultural and language learning programs. I'd also like to talk a little bit more about the another center, the Banolin Center. It opened in 2014 at the Andong Hospital with the aim of providing greater learning opportunities for patients at the hospital. We have a number of happy learning centers in other areas in Korea, but this is the first one that we created within an actual hospital. This is the Andong Hospital, which houses this uh, center. We cater for more than 2,000 users a day uh, of patients who are hospitalized or doing outpatient visits. We've uh, also set up areas within the hospital, like the library or the auditorium, which can also be used for educational activities and seminars. And the hospital really ticked all the boxes in terms of being able to cater as a happy learning center. And as I say, it was created back in 2014. Every year, the city of Angdong and its hospital contribute with 20 million yuan to fund programs for patients at the hospital. The center offers educational programs for children who are hospitalized in the pediatric unit and also general programs for adults, also for pregnant women and programs uh, to improve muscle that status for elderly people or people who are have been hospitalized for a long time. So every year we carry out a satisfaction survey amongst all the citizens who've taken part uh, in the activities of the Le Happy Learning Center. And uh, we do this survey also at the beginning of the semester to understand what is the demand of programs so that then we can do our planning with plenty of time ahead. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And thank you for explaining so well what the Happy Learning Center is. This is a very interesting initiative. And now let's move on to the last intervention in this first round. I'm going to ask a question now for Enrique Crema. He's the coordinator for European projects at the uh, at the City Hall of Barcelona. My question to you, climate shelters in schools. Tell us about this initiative. This initiative was rolled out by the City Hall of Barcelona to, uh, in terms of adaptation to the climate emergency. Could you explain to us what the project is about and what, uh, what parts of the population, what parts of the community have you targeted? Well, yes, thank you very much. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to take part to explain this project. We've devoted a lot of love and care to this project and the outcome has been quite spectacular. Now, climate shelters. This is one of the actions that we have in the climate plan for Barcelona, a plan that the City Hall of Barcelona decided to design to try to adapt and mitigate climate change, mitigation and adaptation. While we can't mitigate, we have to adapt, of course. So the European Union launched a call for tenders or proposals, and we thought about the possibility of creating a network of climate shelters within the city of Barcelona so that when there is climate emergency, 
we are seeing it right now. We are seeing very, very high temperatures throughout Spain. So the general population, but especially the most vulnerable parts of our communities require these shelters. We're talking about young children and also the elderly population. So we've set up these shelters which have been designed so that they can provide great resilience during these peaks of heat waves and, and very high temperatures. We thought about the possibility of schools being good climate shelters. And of course, normally schools are not open to the general public. So we thought perhaps it would be a good idea to open schools up to the public and to try to adapt them. It took us by surprise that schools, well, they were really black spots in the whole network of our municipality in terms of uh, providing shelter in, in times of uh, heat waves and very high temperatures. So they weren't doing very good, very well in schools. So we decided to reverse the situation. We started with a number of pilot projects in Barcelona. We set up a partnership and using three colors, gray, green and blue, we tried to improve the thermal condition of these spaces. That is both inside schools and also in the playground areas. We also wanted to improve the number of pergolas, uh, areas with shadow, trees, etc. Now, green would mean increasing the vegetation in playground areas and also incorporating water as a very necessary element to bring down the temperature in these shelters and areas. So this was a, a, an immense challenge, really. We didn't want to use uh, air conditioning, for example. We wanted to do everything uh, in terms of passive measures to allow to bring down the temperature and, and improve the temperature conditions in these shelters. This was a very complex process, as I've said before. We had another challenge, that is how to implement this project and then ensure that it you know can be extrapolated elsewhere so first of all we had to decide if the project was feasible so we needed to scale up to include more shelters and we've had a spectacular outcome the main goal that we were seeking with the playgrounds creating climate shelters we we started of course looking at other topics and issues our intuition was that indeed this would improve performance of children at school because they would have better temperature conditions also inside schools. So we also wanted to look at health. What would be the health improvements with climate shelters and creating this whole network around the city of Barcelona? Uh, the Town Hall of Barcelona has also another project, Green Spaces, to try to use school playgrounds and uh, to have them open to the public outside of working hours at school, not so much for climate in terms of climate aspects, but rather as green spaces so that they can be offered to the general public as well out of hours. This was also a condition that we put to schools. That is, if they wanted to join this uh, network of open green spaces, Spacios Overts, the idea would be not only to improve the characteristics of playgrounds and schools, not only for, for the community at school, children and teachers, but also for the general public, especially during heat waves and peaks of very high temperatures, as we see very regularly in Barcelona. These uh, high temperatures occur especially in, during the summer months when schools are closed so we want playgrounds to be open to the general public when schools are closed because there is no attendance so that the general public can benefit as well. So this is basically what I wanted to tell you so that you can understand our project. 
what we've managed to achieve is that this is now a main policy at the Barcelona Town Hall when the Consortium of Educators in Barcelona, which has the powers and competencies in terms of education and what happens in schools and playgrounds, well, they also have committed to improving and maintaining schools. And with this perspective, the final outcome has to be that they will join the network of climate shelters we had 10 at the very beginning. We have now more than 600 primary schools in the city that have joined the network. We didn't want to touch uh, uh, kindergartens or secondary school. We're focusing on, on primary schools at the moment. And currently, we are seeing that about 15 more schools a year are joining the network and uh, this effort of creating climate shelters. So I'll leave it there for now and uh, we can continue to discuss later. Thank you very much, Enrique. Definitely, you're providing also political keys that look at scaling up and the appetite of rolling out these projects in other areas. We can talk about this in the debate or at the very end. Now let's move on to our second round of questions. I'm going to follow the same order as I did before. So first of all, Eva, a question to you, Eva Kyle. The Town Hall of Vienna, as you explained, has made enormous strides in terms of incorporating the gender perspective in urban planning. Could you explain a little bit more? How did you organize this internally in order to, to get this up and running? And could you give us a few characteristics of the Fraudenberstadt projects? I hope I've pronounced that correctly, says Yayo Herrero. Tell us a little bit more about how you managed to bring on board the needs of caregivers and not only the people who are cared for. Um, so I have a look of the time <laughs> to start. Um, first, uh, I think it was a bit similar to Barcelona. Um, I was looking back because it was not so such a fixed strategy, but looking back, I can define a strategy um, with different elements. Uh, we, I think it's really important to analyze data. For example, we started with an exhibition now really 35 years ago, Who Owns Public Space? Women's Everyday Life in the City. And for the first time, we analyzed mobility data for men and women separately, and that we could show car driving and biking is male dominated and using public transport and walking is uh, female dominated. And this really helped arguing and was really a bit of uh, eye opener also. So analyzing data, uh, producing awareness that we have a problem we did this also for analyzing and making uh, um, social uh, science uh, survey in parks that there are less girls in parks at a certain age because uh, due to the there are less uh, uh, in their, their mode of appropriation and social role to take the space. Uh, they are weaker than the boys, but also the design only follows the interests on boys. So this really showing this with anal analysis and showing, creating awareness within administration and also on the political level, and then to start with pilot projects and I think, and I, I it, it sounds for me in Barcelona, it was quite similar that if you have good pilot projects or also in Andong, and they, uh, they are speaking for themselves and they're really taking into account this holistic view uh, as the feminist planning approach is producing a better quality, then it's much easier than do a decent evaluation of the pilot projects than then, and this is the hardest job, try to make a consequent roll out of that. And so for park design, we really produced then uh, planning recommendations, we produced a planning manual covering all the different um, 
uh, methods and tools we have developed over the years. We have been inspired by other cities. We didn't invent the row for new, as there is a German saying. I don't know if it exists in Spain. Um, so this was really, uh, um, um, and, and to communicate and share experiences. So this was the strategy and the framework. I think it's really, we had for 10 years, a specific unit of three feminist uh, planners organizing this pilot process. And I think, so you need the capacity and a small budget within administration and, um, and um, and and these pilot projects are really find crucial from the beginning, and so therefore we covered really the different uh, participation. And climate change now is a very uh, strong new topic where I think there is a lot of synthesis between this feminist uh, arguing since 30 years about city of short distances and the importance of green areas. I always say, I feel you get a bit tired always arguing the importance of green open space from the functional, from the user side. And now we learned how important it is also for climate issues. So my saying is if the power structures would have listened more to, uh, to that what feminist planners have argued for many, many years. Our cities now would be much more adapted for the climate uh, crisis. And to Frauenwerkstatt, this was our first big project. And it was again in a, uh, in a phase of rapid growth of population in Vienna that we had to uh, organize new housing projects on former agricultural green areas. And all the necessary urban design was only done by men. So it was a bit a kind of empowerment also for female architects. But, and this was more important, we also stressed on quality criteria and to give examples what is so I we say it's really practical. So this is offering it's already the truth of the site because we would have could have chosen much nicer site. But we said it must really be a practical location. So there is a tram station immediately in front of the building. We have a pharmacy inside, we have a kindergarten inside, there is a big shopping mall beside. There is a primary school only five minutes away, and there is a wild green area just beneath. Um, so it's really quite practical, but it's also on every detail. For example, we have a layout of a flat where the rooms uh, have the same size, and you can change the rooms, and the furniture will always fit and adapt it to the different life circles of a family because small children should be very near beside the sleeping room uh, of the grown-ups but later on the teenagers uh, they like to stay beneath the entrance and don't disturb their parents coming home during the night the kitchen has a very prominent position and giving overview on the playgrounds there are pram stalls on every uh, floor and if you know this with a screaming child, it can be very, uh, <laughs> you're very happy if you have a very short distance entering your flat. Um, uh, there are also um, the, the details like the tracks uh, in the staircase, uh, staircases that there are a, a second one in the height of children. So I think there is, we have, in Vienna for building law, there is the uh, obligation, do we call this washing kitchen? And we made, we, but we asked uh, single parents, mothers, for example, and they complained they need this wash kitchen, but they are very often in the underground floor without windows, very damp and hot. And now we really change that to washing saloons and they're on the ground floor, they are communicative area or they're on the top roof so that you can have a, 
uh, during, uh, you can sit on the common terrace. So I think there are really quite a lot of details and also about safety issues. Um, uh, and there is also the kindergarten. And I think this is what I also learned that you really have this focus on the design and the intention about this, uh, the design of school uh, educational buildings. And I think here in Frauenwerkstatt, I always say this is really a bit the heart of the whole area because there are about eight, nine hundred uh, people living there. And we support it, the social, we always say the staircases must be friendly and there, the density, there must not be too many uh, flat entrances on one staircase because then you know your your neighbors. It's a uh, we, we this greeting border is about, you can have an overview about 30 households. You know your neighbors, if it's more then it's becoming quite anonymous and people doing care work or vulner, it be in a vulnerable position, they're really dependent on this social neighborhood space. And the last sentence is, and this was really a compliment because it was the first project. So it, we had 25 year celebration of tenants move in. And they told me it really feels a bit like to live in a village. And um, so there is really, so this, so the design really supported this uh, social positive space. Muchas gracias, Eva. Continuamos. Eh... Thank you very much, Eva. And now let's go back to Jewon Nam. We're going back to the Happy Learning Centers. And we'd like now to hear from you what benefits you've seen in regarding people's well-being due to the participation in these educational projects and also how these centers contribute to strengthening community uh, links. So if you could give an example, it'd be fantastic. Well, we've seen various effects of, due to this program, but the main one is improvement of physical and mental health. For example, a doctor in a hospital in Yuan carried out a research project to see what the impact was of the participation in training courses for patients that are in hospital. And significant uh, changes have been observed before and after the participation in those courses during the hospital stay. The results of the participation in the program shown that there was an increase in self-esteem and a drop in the level of stress. And this has had a positive impact on mental health. And it's also been a positive impact on physical health, shortening the treatment times. And the Happy Learning Centers have the budgetary support of the city of Andong, but it's 100% managed with the voluntary participation of our citizens. Our city supports citizens so that they can become trainers for adults. We make sure that there is capacity building amongst the local community and lifelong learning. And therefore, our residents can carry out a leadership role when it comes to creating programs and management of the centers and also at an administrative level and so on. Via this process, we hope to see the active participation of our residents in the policies and they also improve their personal skills. In addition, the residents that visit the Happy Learning Centers in the area will also show a greater interest for lifelong learning. And this will allow them to search for other 
learning centers where they also offer lifelong learning with a higher quality, such as, for instance, the one which I'm working at right now, or the lifelong learning institutes that may be found at the university. Every year, our Happy Learning Center organizes an exhibition and presentations of the work carried out by the students and also the materials produced by the learning clubs in order to foster cooperation between the Happy Learning Centers and also to enhance cooperation. In addition to all this, the centers organize different activities, not just activities within this Happy Learning Centers themselves, but also in other public spaces, such as, for instance, at our city hall uh, lobby, at the train station, or also at the Lifelong Learning Center in order to show the results of the training programs that they have carried out. Also in order to uh, share the learning, the a happy experience of learning with other citizens. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to our last of the um, presentations of the people who participated in this monograph, Enrique Cremades, once again. And in this case, the question that we wanted to ask you is, how have you assessed the this participatory process with the education community, with students, with families, and uh, how has it been uh, welcomed into the city? And, and what about the challenges? Very often people are aware of climate change, but not uh, so aware of the impact in their lives. So how have you had that experience? Well, I'd like to divide that into two levels. On one hand, the physical, uh, spaces and how they're divided up, the playground and the school itself, and then uh, uh, building itself, and then the educational project. Both of these come hand in hand, and we've worked on both aspects here. So right from the beginning, we consider that it, this had to be a very proactive project with, uh, involving all the communities. So we, uh, with those 600, uh, schools that we uh, offer this to, we as well offer them the possibility of turning it into a climate shelter. They had to uh, come up with their proposals and we designed an assessment of the centers because we wanted to be very proactive, not just uh, schools that just want to receive and not actually do something themselves. They have to be active players within this process. And that for us was one first way of filtering out these applications. Then the schools that decided to participate, uh, well, we wanted to sort of distribute it throughout the territory and then as our city is divided up into districts, we decided to choose at least one school per district. So schools had to first uh, show interest and in an active manner. That was really important for us. Then once the 10 schools for selected plus a for the private program plus one more, so there's 11 schools in all, what we did was get in touch with the communities in order to design those educational projects. So we had participatory roundtables with the drawings, the plans of the schools, and together with the teachers and the children, both uh, usually uh, the uh, older kids within primary school, where well, everybody participated, but we really wanted the elder children to participate, and I'll tell you more about that later on. So we drew up a plan, and we tried to mark where the warmer areas were, where there is a lack of shade, uh, where do children like to play and what do they play and so on. So we would mark that and with different little stickers and colors and so on. And and with various activities, the children themselves and the teachers were the ones who designed or at least uh, showed what their uh, needs were, what was lacking within their schools. Some schools uh, already had window shades, so they didn't ask for window shades, but they may want a pergola because the youngest 
children's classrooms were facing the west and there, there was a lot of sun. So we wanted each of the projects to be tailored to the school itself. There were a lot of suggestions from the educa education community, which was then uh, sent to the architects uh, who would be in charge. And then, of course, the architects as professionals would propose the designs, taking into account the needs of each of the schools. Now, you have to take into account that all this was going on just before the pandemic. And then, of course, COVID hit us, and we seem to have forgotten all about it now. It seems that it never happened. But that COVID had a huge and dramatic impact on our lives for a couple of years. We were very lucky because all this process was carried out just before lockdown. So during lockdown, we actually did the building works. And then when we once again came back to life, so to say, then we already had the works done and we were able to start to see what the results were. So, of course, if you plant a tree, that's only a little stick. So this is a medium long term pro uh, project. And that is how we did it from an operational perspective. And this came hand in hand with an educational project. So if you want to, for instance, give up smoking, the best thing you can do is explain, if you want someone to live, stop smoking, you have to explain to them that it's bad to smoke. That's how society stops smoking, because kids are going to tell their parents on and on, stop smoking, it's bad for you. So the best way to make our society aware of we have an issue with climate change is raise awareness amongst children, because they're the ones who will then really get on to the adults um, and insist and insist so we act upon it. And we therefore, we really wanted to have an educational project behind this, which would be part of the curriculum of the schools. And it would be the actual children themselves who would be monitoring the improvements regarding temperature, uh, humidity, or, and uh, how livable the conditions were within the classrooms. So, first of all, we had a training course for the teachers, uh, raising awareness on climate change and its consequences. So it was a very short time. Of course, this was time ago. A lot of, there was still a lot of people who uh, did not believe in climate change and they were climate deniers. So we first trained our teachers and then we used the last two years of school children, the, the fifth and sixth year school children, the ones who then end primary school and then go to a different school. And it would be them leading this program of climate change. So the six formers were the ones responsible to explain to the fifth formers what all this is about. So then the fifth formers will have been working on this for a whole year. And when they then uh, start sixth form, they can teach the younger children. So it's uh, there is an active feedback cycle there and of, between the children and also with the participation of the whole community. And then regarding, the, well, well, that's basically how we designed it, how people participated. Well, thank you very much for all your contributions. And now, Marina, I think maybe now we can open up the floor to our attendees. Well, perfect. We have really managed time very well today. So thank you very much to all of you. And now let's open up the floor so that you can ask your questions to the different speakers, authors, to our coordinator or to whoever you wish. You can take the floor by raising your hand and then we can open your mics. Muy bien, veo que tenemos Dos peticiones de... Good, I see we have two people asking for the floor. On the one hand, we have Tobar. Yes. Go ahead. 
please introduce yourself first and what city you come from. Hello. I work in social services at the City Council of Burgos. And both personally and professionally, I'm involved in this. And I was listening to the second uh, part of Eva Kyle's uh, question about how they had managed the situation in the city of Vienna, the city council. And I've taken some notes, but I think that she spoke about incorporating female architects in urban planning, which of course is really important because women often been left out and cities have been planned and designed exclusively by men up to a short time ago. And I'm very interested in the needs of the carers because I also have a carer that uh, I have to take care of. And we do not hear very much about what the needs are of the actual carers and how cities really are not properly designed in order to look after people who have to look after others, dependents. So what experiences or what initiatives do you have in the city of Vienna for carers? Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I'm not quite sure if I have understand the question. So, so because the English translation was carers, so people who are they care of. Did I understood this right? So about the, the children or the elderly or handicapped. Yeah. So I I think um, what is really, I very often, um, um, my experience is that it's really, um, that it's very important that you try to get the experience and the direct feedback and formulation of people um, taken care of. Um, so for example, we are now an aging society and to, uh, to make studies, field studies with people with a, a still um, not very strong, but starting uh, dementia. Uh, is it yeah and how they can orientate in the field and then accompany them so feminist planners went to them and 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 try to understand what the need for orientation and and I think this is so important to translate this into the technical language I think a lot of uh, this gender planning is to translate social issues into planning and into the, 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 the language and criteria of technicians. Or another thing is before senior residences, so that what I've learned is the question of calibration and the hidden calibration again. So for example, the speed calculation of traffic lights and this is again for a healthy young adult, the, the, the calculation speed about the necessity of green light for. And we, we decided in the city of Vienna to get to, um, to use a reduced speed calculation before senior residences, where you know where your target group is really uh, a lot of people are living there. Another thing is really there, there are quite a lot of ongoing participation processes, but I think again, it's very necessary that you take into account because you also can have again a gender bias in participation processes. It's really depending how you organize it, because if you just make it very normal, then you get again this middle class or uh, higher class, educated, elderly people, bias of shouting and fighting, and the vulnerable groups and the very high age, they won't come. So then I think sometimes it's you can involve them, and sometimes it's really necessary that the planners 
uh, take into consideration from their experience and try to formulate these needs. And therefore, we have developed a fairness check. It was about, for example, how you can organize a healthy neighborhood for elderly people and really to discuss measurements from defined target groups. So some, I think it's, it needs this mix of methods. The direct involvement is the best. And the second best is to have social sensitive planners and really tell them define the target groups and then discuss it with your professional experience and your ideas what is best for them. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, I see another hand, um, Sandra Pereira. Tienes la palabra si quieres intervenir. Te presentas, por favor. Please introduce yourself, Sandra Pereira. No sound on the speaker. Well, apparently Sandra does not have a question anymore, so we'll move on. Well, while we await any requests for the floor, let me say on behalf of our association, that we are very, very pleased to see so many of you here today representing cities and institutions alike. This is a great source of inspiration for us to continue to work uh, very keenly on these topics. You'll see when you read the monograph, which is now available under the section publications on our portal, well, you'll see as you read the monograph that care is polyedric. They affect us in our personal sphere, our work, our social sphere as well. And with all the articles and examples that you'll be reading, you'll see that all of this providing care means healing, accompanying, teaching, rearing, understanding, consoling. We'll see that in the article by Micolini, how to console, how important that is. And giving care is not only caring for each other as a species, but also caring for our in environment, saving energy, recycling. I'd like to congratulate all the authors, co-authors and contributors for their thoughts included in this publication. And we hope that it will have a political impact. We urge you to read it, but especially we urge you to become inspired by these practices so that you can apply them in your own cities. Yayo, uh, I don't see any requests for the floor. Yes, we do, in fact, have one from Mila. Please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mila Garcia, Town Hall of Catarroja in Valencia. I'm the coordinator for education. Firstly, let me congratulate, congratulate you and you personally, Marina, for organizing this very interesting session. I have a question for Enrique Gremades. You said that you have reported the benefits at these schools uh, that have come on board the Climate Shelter Initiative. Could you please explain to us how have you actually measured these benefits and what are the benefits themselves? In other words, what improvements have you seen with this initiative? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. There were two types of indicators that we uh, measured. One, a group of physical indicators, for example, drops in temperature thanks to the measures, increase of humidity or the right level of humidity, also wind speed, also particles in suspension were measures as well to analyze air quality. And we also had an indicator on noise pollution. So we wanted to measure air quality and also 
uh, noise pollution in the classrooms. We were also very keen to look at other indicators, not so much quantitative ones, but qualitative ones, which are more difficult to measure and quantify. One of our partners, in the partnership in the consortium that we created to roll out this initiative. I explained it before, perhaps I didn't, but in this project, it's not only the Town Hall of Barcelona, City Council of Barcelona, but other partners, each uh, contributing with their know-how and knowledge in order to and be able to roll out the project. The project. Amongst these partners, S Global, or another public entity in Barcelona, the Education Consortium of Barcelona as well, Urban Ecology, the Municipal Institute for Urban Planning, and also the schools, of course. And we had another partner, ICAI, which is a, a department within the University of Barcelona. We also had the Public Health Agency of Barcelona, a very important partner, because they carry out studies to roll out policies in terms of health, but not in terms of uh, hospitalization or providing health assistance, but rather as prevention. Now, they have enormous knowledge on these topics, so they were the ones who des designed the survey or the questionnaire, and also the indicators that had to be measured before and after the project. And there were so many indicators, many to do with perception, for example, smiley faces or crying faces so that kids could be able to identify how they feel about coming to school, for instance, smiley face or crying face. We ask kids about, how do you feel about coming to school to play with your schoolmates? How do you feel about being in school? Do you like being in school and using these emojis? And we do this before the intervention and after as well. But of course, we had the enormous problem of the pandemic, which affected everyone. So many of the studies that we were planning to roll out for comparison, really, well, had to be halted because of the pandemic. Remember that our hypothesis, our starting hypothesis, was that indeed we could uh, improve the situation a lot in schools, but we didn't know if there could be some detrimental effects as well. So we would have liked to have a, a richer project and with more indicators. And we also carried out a study on happiness and the type of indicators that have to do with happiness. And in most cases, things have improved. Kids now say that they do want to go to school. Um, they are happy to go to school, but we didn't know whether it was because they had been in lockdown for so long and they really wanted to see their friends or whether they like to go to school now because it was better to go to school than to stay at home in lockdown. What I can suggest, if you're really keen to understand more about this, you can send me your email or contact, and I can put you in touch with the uh, um, Barcelona Public Health Agency. They're really, really good at what they do, and they can be very, very helpful if you want to carry out similar studies in, in your location. I'm, I'm sure they'll be very helpful. So on a one-to-one, -one, I can share the contact details, and you can perhaps get in touch with them. Well, lovely. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thank you, Eva, for your uh, your name as well. Thank you, Eva. And I think we are going to close now. If you feel that you want to delve deeper into the topic, we have another appointment this afternoon with other authors and co-authors, and we'll continue to talk about the importance of care. Well, in closing, let me just give you a few remarks very quickly as a result of what has been put on the table. So very, very quickly, a few bullet points of very important topics in my view. Firstly, raising awareness in terms of care, 
care was and still is invisible as ever pointed out and we have to make it visible this is crucial absolutely pivotal so that we can put caring and caregiving at the heart of everything Eva said very clearly that mobility policies and safety and security are also key in cities. Perhaps it's not the normal concept of security and safety that we see portrayed in the media in terms of sometimes uh, protecting the elite, but more looking at security and safety so that life will not be precarious, will be not be filled with uncertainty and can be lived in a more dignified manner. Secondly, another crucial element, the need to have a gender, gender perspective, a feminist view in all these policies, not only to improve the life of women, but to improve the life of everyone. We have to look at urban planning and life from a feminist perspective so that vulnerability can be put at the heart of everything so that cities can work better for everyone. A third component, which I believe has been put forward by the three speakers, and that is the integrity of public policy in cities. That is, all the experiences that we are showcasing are experiences that capitalize on existing infrastructure, improving these spaces so that the general public can use them, capitalizing on existing resources. It's like social recycling, if you like, of infrastructures. And it also considers infrastructures as the big palaces of the people, that is, areas that citizens and the public can use as their own um, spaces as well. Another key point, scalability, upscaling. And we also have to think about cooperation between cities. Enrique just mentioned it when the Catarroja representative said, well, yes, we'd like your help so that you can capitalize on the experience in Barcelona. I think cooperation between cities is pivotal, crucial. Also very important, the whole thread of continuity, that is from having data available so that we can understand the environment, the space where these interventions are being rolled out and also the availability of multidisciplinary teams that can join the effort, that is, so that we can apply all the learnings through pilot projects and make the most of the know-how that we have in practical terms. It shouldn't just be theoretical in a, pro a theoretical approach. We shouldn't roll out and then check the mistakes, but rather beforehand, we have to look at the connection between data, know-how, capabilities, and best practices, and how to roll it out in practice. Another component or element that I'd like to highlight, which I've seen mentioned by various uh, speakers, is um, cooperation between the public and the community. If we want to scale up these projects, they will only happen if we do it uh, from public policy that goes from the bottom up. And if we want to make them more upscalable, we need to have support from public administration, the public policy, so public-private collaboration as well, so that citizens can cooperate with the administrations, and this is a two-way street, so that citizens can learn from the institutions and the other way around. I think this is also key. Of course, education as the central pillar to all of this has been highlighted when Enrique talked about how important it was to include these climate shelters in schools and to make them examples for education, for learning, etc. But Enrique also pointed out that very key uh, to his project was that we've also seen this in Andong. And uh, communication, highlighting the importance of communication and raising awareness. This is also very important. It's non, it's informal education, but we require communication and awareness raising. Because as Enrique was saying, 
The starting point is that part of the public is confused. There are climate change deniers, and some people deny the existence of problems that need to be addressed. So we need these people to participate as well. And for that, awareness raising is crucial. And finally, the question that was raised from Burgos the, about the importance of direct participation of caregivers, mainly women, and also public administration's responsibility in terms of taking care of caregivers. For example, we have to look at public services, community public services that might alleviate the burden of care with caregivers, also respecting the right of every woman, I repeat, every woman does not have to take care of a person if she doesn't want to. These things happen sometimes and it has to be recognized. So we have to uh, call upon our collective responsibility to guarantee caregiving. I think the contributions today have been extremely rich in, in content to open our debate. Clearly, if we look at the monograph now, after what we've heard this morning, we'll have opportunities to try to change our views. And we have a very rich network here, so we need to uh, continue to grow on the basis of all these excellent contributions. Well, thank you very much, Yayo, for this very comprehensive overview of the ideas that have come out this morning after this dialogue. And again, let me say thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. And Let's all remember that we have to put care at the center of our political action. Let's hope that we can continue to progress together, learning from each other. And we're always here if you need us. And please do read the publication. We will try to send you shortly a printed copy, uh, but in the meantime, you have it online available to you. Thank you so much again for your participation. And we'll now close the session. Muchas gracias y adiós. Thank you very much and goodbye.